Good morning and welcome to the August 15th, 2023 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I'll ask our Deputy Council, John Weiss, to call the roll. Chair Taylor? Here. Vice Chair Bland? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Here. Commissioner Chu? Commissioner Ginsburg? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Here. Commissioner Holford Smith? I managed to do it. Okay, sir. can you do it in here? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Yeah. Commissioner Lutfi? Here. And Commissioner Master? Yes. Yes. All set. All right. Good morning again, and welcome to our public hearing and public meeting of August 15th, 2023. Um, this meeting is being held in person at our in our hearing room at the David N. Dinkins Municipal Building at One Center Street on the ninth floor. And we are also uh, holding the meeting via Zoom so that the public and some commissioners can participate remotely. And um, this morning we will begin with a public meeting agenda from the research department with two proposals uh, for the commission to consider calendaring. And then we'll move to the preservation department agenda where we will review new applications for work on designated properties. And then also a public meeting agenda where we'll, we will review uh, applications that have already had a public hearing and are back today with a revised proposal. And with that, I will turn it over to Caitlin Liss McHale, our Director of Research, to take us through the research agenda. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Um, this morning, we are proposing two parks in the Bronx for consideration as landmarks. Um, and these both were identified by the research department during our um, work in the Bronx recently updating our comprehensive survey, um, and we're really excited to present them today. Item number one is LP 2674, Joseph Rodman Drake Park, an enslaved African burial ground, Oak Point Avenue, Drake Park South, Longfellow Avenue, and Hunts Point Avenue in the Bronx, Block 2772, Lot 170. The item proposed for the Commission's calendar is a New York City park, opened in 1910, containing two surviving colonial era cemeteries for Hunts Point's early European descended settler families and for the African and indigenous people they enslaved. Presenting this morning is Michael Karatsis. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Michael Karatsis of the Research Department presenting Joseph Rodman Drake Park, an enslaved African burial ground in the Bronx, which memorializes enslaved people who were central to the early history of Hunts Point and New York City. Located in the Hunts Point neighborhood of the Bronx, Drake Park is bounded by Oak Point, Longfellow, and Hunts Point Avenues in Drake Park South. It opened as a public park dedicated to the poet Joseph Rodman Drake, in 1910. It is located in an area of the Bronx with few other designated landmarks. The closest are the Sunny Slope House, designated in 1981, American Banknote Printing Plant, designated in 2008, and the Manila Street Historic District, designated in 2021. The proposed landmark site is a tax lot containing the park, recognizing its history dating back to at least the early 1700s, and protecting its above and below ground resources. Drake Park is rare in New York City in that it contains two surviving colonial era cemeteries containing burials of both early European descended settler families and the people they enslaved. The Hunt Willett Leggett Cemetery near the park center contains burials associated with these three families who established homesteads on Hunts Point starting in the late 1600s. Just to its south, also within the bounds of the park, is the burial ground for those enslaved by these families prior to the abolition of slavery in New York State in 1827. These cemeteries were separated by a former indigenous trail and later colonial cartway called Hunts Point Road 
that was demapped and buried during the development of Drake Park. Today, a park pathway separates the two cemeteries as Hunts Point Road did when they were active burial grounds. In 2021, the park was renamed Joseph Rodman Drake Park, an enslaved African burial ground, to recognize the presence of the enslaved people cemetery, which lost its markers following the creation of Drake Park and has only recently been rediscovered. Prior to European contact, Hunts Point was the home of the Muncie speaking Solonoi people, who were displaced following the 1663 quote unquote sale of the area to English settlers. Hunts Point's geography was drastically different then, consisting of two small peninsulas, Long Neck and Planting Neck, surrounding a small bay that has since been filled in. By the late 1600s, Thomas Hunt Jr., for whom Hunts Point is named, and Gabriel Leggett acquired Hunts Point through marriage. During the 1700s, these two families were joined in the area by members of the Wilt family. By the 1720s, the Hunts established a family cemetery on the north side of Hunts Point Road, which linked the two necks where all three families had homesteads. It is likely that the enslaved people's burial ground on the south side of the road was also established around that time. <laughs> Slavery began in New York when the Dutch West India Company brought 11 enslaved people of African descent to the city, then called New Amsterdam in 1626. Enslaved people performed practically all kinds of work, including the construction of Fort Amsterdam shown here. Their labor proved crucial to the survival of New Netherland colony under the Dutch and the subsequent growth of New York as a British colony after 1664. Under the British, Black people's right to end property was taken away. New laws made it harder for enslaved people to be freed and severely restricted their movement and ability to gather out of fear that such behavior could foster a revolt. Punishment was swift and brutal. During the 1700s, New York's enslaved population was the largest in the North. By 1750, half of the city's households had enslaved people who made up 20% of the population. Westchester County, which Hunts Point was part of, was also a slavery stronghold, containing many large agri agricultural plantations, as their owners commonly called them. 60 people were enslaved at Lewis Morris's manor west of Hunts Point, whose name lives on as the Morrisania neighborhood of the Bronx. Enslavers buried in the Hunt Hill at Leggett Cemetery include Thomas Hunt, the confidant of George Washington and revolutionary war hero, whose will is shown above, and Ebenezer Leggett shown inheriting a, quote, Negro boy called Jim, unquote, from his father John. In 1790, Hunt enslaved 10 people and Leggett enslaved six. The Hunt Willett Leggett burial ground where these enslavers were buried contains about two dozen inscribed gravestones protected within an iron fence. As intended by Drake Park's builders, it is the park's dominant visual feature. Notable gravestones in the cemetery include its earliest known grave marker dating from 1729, as well as a rare, well preserved 18th century cherub's head gravestone from 1749. The cemetery's most famous grave is of the poet Joseph Rodman Drake, for whom the park would be named. Born in New York in 1795, Drake was a Hunt family friend who lived for a time in their Hunts Point home. When he died in 1820, the Hunts honored his wish to be buried by his beloved Bronx River, to which he had written a well-known ode. Drake's poetry was admired into the 20th century. In 1915, a plaque inscribed with a stanza of his poem about the Bronx River was installed along its banks in the New York Botanical Garden. About 25 feet south of the Hunt Willett Leggett Cemetery was the burial ground for enslaved people who labored for these families. Today, this park pathway runs in the approximate location of the old Hunts Point Road, which historically separated the two cemeteries. Unlike the Hunt Willett Leggett Cemetery with its very visible fence and historic markers, no markers remain to memorialize the people buried here. This discrepancy in the treatment of the two burial grounds exemplifies the erasure of enslaved people from the city's history and the elevation of their enslavers. The settling of the enslaved people's burial ground close to but separate from 
that of their enslavers was typical. As archaeologist William Calver explained in 1920, quote, there was custom more forcible than law, that the servant could not be consigned to consecrated ground. For further proof of this, one need only to stroll out to the Hunts Point Road. And there were other ancient lords and masters of the soil in the Hunt and Leggett burial ground may be seen the usual adjunct of a slave plot just across the roadway. Unquote. The land surrounding both cemeteries and the entirety of planting that remained in the Hunt family until 1858, when Eliza Hunt sold all of it except for the Hunt Will at Leggett Cemetery. As shown in this 1858 survey map from the time of the sale, the cemetery on the north side of Hunt's Point was marked reserved, meaning that it would remain, remain with the Hunt family. The enslaved people's burial ground on the south side of Hunt's Point was unmarked and included with the rest of the sale. By 1904, the neighborhood's accelerating development and plans for the new street grid, which included a street through the Hunt Willet Leggett Cemetery, raised public concerns over destroying the final resting places of Drake and quote unquote distinguished men significant in the area's colonial history. Although public park was being proposed adjacent to the cemetery, it would not have included and thus protected it. It would, however, have included the enslaved people's cemetery. One major advocate objected to designating, quote, as a public park to land on the southerly side of the old Hunts Point Road, where rest the remains of the slaves of the colonists, while ignoring the graves of the noble patriots, unquote, buried nearby. A campaign to save the Hunt Road like its cemetery by enlarging the proposed park to include it was successful, as the proposed street was demapped and Drake Park opened in 1910. Numerous accounts confirm that the enslaved people's burial ground remained known and visible after the park's opening. In 1913, the Reverend, Reverend Theodore A. Leggett described, quote, the burying place of the slaves of the Leggett family and other families containing a good many irregular shaped headstones, unquote. These markers appear in a photograph in the collections of the Museum of the City of New York, dated to around 1910 and labeled Slave Burying Ground Hunts Point Road. After about 1920, published accounts of the enslaved people's cemetery stopped appearing, and its main above ground artifacts, its headstones were apparently discarded, relocated, or buried. It was essentially forgotten until about 10 years ago when a Department of Education official, Philip Pateritas, came across a circa 1910 slave burying ground photograph shown here on the Museum of the City of New York's website. <clears throat> this led Panaritas to research the site and advocate for its recognition. A subsequent state grant funded an, an archaeological study of the site and programs of the S48, the Joseph Rodman Drake School, to engage students in the research. With the students' assistance, the archaeological study was completed in March of 2017 by Dr. Jessica Strabel McLean, an urban archaeologist now on the staff of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The study included a subsurface ground penetrating radar survey focusing on a section of the park documented as the enslaved people's burial ground. The radar identified four burials south of the pathway, likely those of enslaved people who toiled on Hunts Point estates into the 19th century. These burials lie beneath a layer of fill added as part of the park's construction. Today, there is no visual evidence of the enslaved people's burial ground. The people buried here are anonymous. No records documenting their names or burials have been found. They may include the few enslaved people whose names have come down through, excuse me, through official records, including a man, Mingo, and a girl, Sarah, mentioned in the 1694 will of Thomas Hunt, Hannah, whom Thomas Hunt Jr. sold to his daughter, Abigail, in 1700 on the condition that Hannah continued to, quote, wait upon me and my wife so long as either of us lives, unquote, and Abram, Titus, Toby, Lily, and Jim, who were listed with Thomas Hunt's household in the 1755 census of enslaved people in New York. As with other enslaved people in rural New York estates, their duties likely included domestic work, such as cooking, laundering, cleaning, and child care, as well as clearing land, building and repairing structures, 
cultivating crops, harvesting produce and salt hay, dairying and tending and butchering livestock. Those enslaved in Hunts Point by members of the Hunt Willett and Leggett families included people of indigenous as well as African descent. This advertisement describes a, quote, servant man, half Indian, half Negro, unquote, who sought freedom from Gabriel Leggett in 1744. During Drake Park's construction, it is possible that other burials in the enslaved people's burial ground were exhumed and reinterred, along with their markers in the southern portion of the Hunt Willett Leggett Cemetery, where about 15 unworked, mostly buried field stones are clustered toward the cemetery's southern end. Research into this is ongoing. Drake Park's design and appearance have changed since its early years. A two-story wood cottage built before 1868 remained in the park until at least 1921. Its former location is an additional site of archaeological sensitivity. By 1936, the Hunt Row at Leggett Cemetery was surrounded by a neatly trimmed hedge. The current system of pathways appears to have taken shape by the mid-1950s. The iron fence surrounding the Hunt Row at Leggett Cemetery appears to have been installed in the 1960s. Today, the park is both a site of major historical importance and a vital green space in an industrial section of Hunts Point, where it is ringed by warehouses adjacent to the Hunts Point food markets. As the park has evolved over time, so has its meaning. In 2021, the Parks Department installed signs announcing its new name, Joseph Rodman Drake Park and Enslaved African Burial Ground. At the time, the Parks Department's Bronx Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, expressed, quote, hope that these new signs, which honor the enslaved buried in the park, will spur reflection, remembrance, and pursuit for greater knowledge and understanding for all who visit the park in the future, unquote. Originally created in remembrance of Joseph Rodman Drake and the area's colonial era landowners, Drake Park now recognizes enslaved people whose history in the area and final resting place within the park long went unrecognized. Given the enslavement of both African and, ind and indigenous people in the Bronx, the documented enslavement of, an, of indigenous people by members of the Leggett family, and the likely burial of both African and indigenous enslaved people here, research associated with this proposed designation may lead to a more inclusive landmark name. Were Drake Park to be designated, it would join several designated landmarks and, and districts with historic cemeteries regulated by the Landmarks Commission. These include sites as diverse as the African Burial Ground in Lower Manhattan, part of the African Burial Ground in the Commons Historic District, and now a National Monument, Trinity Church Cemetery, and First Sheriff Israel Graveyard, also in Lower Manhattan, and the Westville AME Zion Church Cemetery in the historic African-American oyster community of Sandy Ground on Staten Island. In addition to regulating visible above-ground features such as gravestone markers and monuments, LPC's Archaeology Department reviews proposed work at these sites to make sure that burials are not impacted. The research department recommends the commission vote to calendar Joseph Rodman Drake Park and enslaved burial ground for consideration as an, as an individual landmark. Thank you, Mike. I also want to acknowledge our Director of Archaeology, Amanda Sepfin, and Jessica Strubel-McLean, uh, the archaeologist mentioned, who did the research and archaeology work here. And they both have collaborated with Mike and the research team uh, to bring this forward and ensure that we're telling the full history. So questions? Yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. Okay, any questions? Yes. Um, over the century, how many people have been interred in the burial ground? Do you have a count? So can you just come up to the mic so the Zoom can pick you up? And uh, since the camera didn't pick you up before, just Jessica, state your name as well before you speak. Good morning. I'm Jessica McLean. I'm an urban archaeologist here at uh, Landmarks. Could you please, sir, repeat your question? I couldn't hear it. Over the centuries, how many 
people have been interred uh, in that burial. It's an excellent question and one that we unfortunately don't have the answer to. Um, we don't specifically know who was interred in the burial ground. And so we are extrapolating um, possible candidates based on um, records that indicate who was enslaved by uh, the settler families of Hunts Point. So I, it, until we find the documentation um, that records specific individuals, um, um, we are there. There's an element of of guesswork going in. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Goldblum. Is there a plan to fence it and identify the slave portion and slave persons portion by the Parks Department? I, uh, we, I cannot speak for the Parks Department. Um, I can only speak um, based uh, on the work that I was done that that I did right. at the time. Um, I think that that. Uh, that is that is a question that is is best suited for the parks department. So um, we don't have any knowledge as a as a commission uh, or an agency of any plans by parks to do anything with this at all. Um, I'm going to defer to, yeah, to I, Kate to answer that sure, question. Yeah, we we don't. I think the the main thing that was done is to change the name of the park to recognize the history there. Um, but they, I believe, parks department is pursuing um, additional research that I think will be helped a lot by this project as well um, to better understand the history and, and hopefully who was buried there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say uh, and, uh, the same thing is happening at Van Quentin Park where a, uh, an enslaved uh, uh, burial, person's burial ground was identified about two years ago and it has been marked officially for the fence by the Parks Department and it was evidently relatively easily done. So I would strongly, strongly urge the, the commission to make a recommendation to the to the parks department to do it. It didn't seem like it was such a big deal. And you know, Bank Island gets no money. So uh yeah, we're working closely with the parks department so we can certainly pass that suggestion on. And of course, the entire park is fenced. This is more about like a block-sized park that has an entire fence it's that's really, fenced it's around really the perimeter. Educational value. I mean, it's, it's all about you know people being able to see it yeah. and identify with it, especially in this neighborhood. Really important. If I may follow up with the report, um, when I originally wrote it, was submitted to the Parks Department. So that was who I was working for when I did the report. So they're fully apprised um, of what they have. And um, there were community um, meetings um, about the site, sharing the information with the local community. <laughs> I don't know whether they'd be happy about that or disappointed. Yeah. No, I, and I, I, well, I would say that the Parks Department has been incredibly supportive of our efforts and working with us toward this. I think they recognize the incredible significance here. And I think that our designation will just, as Kate said, continue to move their research and their projects forward with a new lens. Yes, Commissioner Latvey. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say this is like extraordinary work and the whole thing is very moving and so important. As Michael said, thank you so much for, I'm just gonna use the term unearthing this for us. <laughs> it is incredible, I agree. Commissioner Welling, uh, Chen, Commissioner Chen. <laughs> yeah, just like all the same, I love the people that are fascinating and uh, uh, well done. Um, I have a couple of questions to just want to make this point. There's so many cemeteries as now, right? Uh, the African is outside of the Trinity is down the block. There's faces in the Jewish cemetery. Uh, so the question is, I know, for example, the Jewish cemetery was originally larger. So my concern is, if we don't know the exact boundary, so to speak, are we sure we have identified at least the limit that will, you know, at least preserve for the future? And the second part is, when a Trinity Church cemetery was open to the public, I mean, obviously, outside has a fence. So the question is, to Michael's point, as a policy for the RPC, do we want people to come up close to look at it? Was it engraved on the sun that it is still visible? Or do we just say, hands off, just look at it and go away? 
So those are some of my questions. To answer the the first question, um, the way that we identified the presence of burials was using ground penetrating radar. So the initial survey that we conducted encompassed the entire southern side of the park. And I worked closely with a, a GPR specialist who whose who's particular uh, specialty is with with um, burials. So guide uh, our second survey was guided by that initial large scale survey and we did what's known as a close intervals uh survey zeroing in on the area where we had identified burials. So there is always the possibility that we missed something, but with um, a fairly high degree of con confidence, we have found, um, it delineated the bounds of the particular, of, of, of what we believe to be the enslaved burial ground. Um, I think that, that um, as, as my Michael alluded to that there is the possibility that some of the graves were disinterred and relocated across the street within the bounds of the fenced in cemetery. Um, but the um, but I do feel feel confident that we have done to the best of our ability identified the boundaries. Um, and I think the, the the positive thing is that they are they are safely in a part of the park that is away from traffic. Um, and it's sort of protected by the amount of fill that was subsequently brought to the park to create um, the park. So it is it's sort of a win-win situation in that perspective in terms of the preservation of the enslaved burial ground. Your second question, if you could repeat, please. The park is open to the public and the area where the enslaved burial is, is part of that open space. So there is no, um, there are no barriers and that the signage that Mike um, alluded to that describes the presence of the enslaved burial ground is affixed to um, the iron fence around um, the, uh, the other portion of the burial ground. So there is signage that's acknowledging it. Um, and I think one of the, the questions that the Parks Department was originally engaging with is that very question that you raised. Do you draw attention to it? Do you, uh, or do you not in order to protect it and use other means of interpretation um, to preserve the memory of the individual's burial? Uh, yeah, I hear right that the indigenous burial as well. Are those enslaved or just indigenous? We have, um, Mike, would you like to answer this? I don't want to take over your we, we do, that's okay. Um, yeah, we did uh, just allude to it quickly in the presentation um, and showed an, an ad um, that was placed by one of the Leggett, members of the Leggett family um, that described the person who had sought freedom and um, described him as half Indian, half Negro. And I believe Jessica's research had also identified other individuals of indigenous descent who were enslaved by other members of the Leggett family. Um, and this was the enslavement of indigenous people was a practice. Um, I think maybe a lot of the public is not very well aware of that, um, but it was a practice and it did occur in this area in, in what was then Westchester County. Would the Chief Jar have identified any of the headstones? Um, they would have. And there are two um, unidentified anomalies that um, that might be um, presence of headstones, um, but we we avoided any excavation. We wanted this to be purely um, above ground so as to not, not disturb anything. Thanks. Did I, did I hear you correctly? Indigenous people are also in them? Yes, sir. Particularly in the early colonial period in New York. Mm -hmm. So the, there is, a, I think the, the team feels that there's a likelihood that there are probably indigenous people buried here as well. But it, you know, is they've also stated there's, you know, there isn't documentation of individuals so to go on. Okay. And so I think that's why as we continue to do our research, we will continue to think about the name and how to recognize uh, you know, all of the potential uh, enslaved peoples here. 
Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Sarah, Sarah, I have a. <laughs> oh yes, Commissioner, Vice Chair Bland. Sorry, um, I, I don't want to prolong this extraordinarily wonderful conversation, but I just wanted to add my point too, not a question at all, but a comment. I seem to have an insatiable interest in New York City history, but I want to say that listening to uh, the, the, the commission's staff reports over 14 or 15 years that I've been on the commission now is just simply extraordinary. I know there's repository of our history everywhere from the New York Public Library to the New York Historical Society, Brooklyn Historical Society, on and on and on. But somehow what the commission's uh, staff has now come up with over these years is extraordinary. And listening to it as today, really almost the most interesting of all. It just makes me think that somehow all this should be collected in a book itself. Um, Anyway, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, like we're moving much, much more further into cultural designation reports, uh, cultural uh, designations. Um, the idea that uh, archaeology, which has been part of the um, commission's purview from the beginning, I realize, but it seems like we're moving into a period now where archaeology, in other words, what's happening below what we see is becoming hugely important. And I just applaud the movement here of, uh, of our commission and its staff in this direction. And I really compliment those who worked on this report today. It's just thrilling to understand this now more clearly. And hopefully we are able to market and understand our history so much better because of this kind of work. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Vice Chair Bland. It's uh, great to hear that. And I also want to thank the team for their continued efforts as we strive to ensure that we tell the full history of New York City and the story of all New Yorkers. So with that, um, I think if we can make a motion to uh, calendar this and have a vote, that would be great. So Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to make a motion that we calendar? Gladly. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <laughs> so this is now officially on the commission's calendar, and we will hold a public hearing in the near future. Thank you all. And we'll move to the next item. Item two this morning is LP2673, Old Croton Aqueduct Walk at 2200 Aqueduct Avenue uh, proposed as a scenic landmark. Um, and the item proposed for the commission that commission's calendar is a New York City park located on top of a section of the 1842 Old Croton Aqueduct designed by John B. Jervis. The proposed landmark site includes um, several blocks and lots which are listed in the agenda and will be described in the following presentation. Uh, which will be given this morning by Sarah Eccles. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sarah Eccles from the Research Department presenting the Old Croton Aqueduct Walk in the Bronx. The Old Croton Aqueduct Walk is a proposed as New York City's 12th and the Bronx's first scenic landmark. The Croton Aqueduct, completed in 1842, was the first direct water source to New York City, providing life-sustaining clean water to the city. This engineering marvel allowed New York City's development to accelerate rapidly through the 19th century, during which the embankment atop the aqueduct became a favored public walkway. The section known as Aqueduct Walk was especially cared for by the communities of Fordham and University Heights, who fought for its preservation twice, eventually securing it as a permanent public park. The proposed Aqueduct Walk scenic landmark is located between West Kingsford Road and West Burnside Avenue in the Bronx. The landmark site is situated within a New York City park that is comprised of a small section of the Old Croton Aqueduct. This 4.9 acre shoestring park has been under the control of the Parks Department since 1930. New York City had been struggling to find clean water beginning in the early 1700s. But in the early 1800s, the situation became dire. 
The population was growing rapidly, the little water the city had was heavily polluted, and the river's water was brackish. Without readily available clean water, the city had an inability to fight fires, couldn't clean the streets, and became increasingly vulnerable to widespread disease. Politics and money delayed the construction of a successful aqueduct, but when cholera hit New York in 1832, it prompted city officials to take swift action and ultimately decide to construct an aqueduct from Croton. However, arguments over the aqueduct, including its location, financing, and engineers, delayed movement on the project until the spring of 1837, when ground was finally broken on the Croton Aqueduct. The first engineer of the old Croton Aqueduct was David Douglas, but he was replaced in 1836 by John B. Jervis, who completed most of the route, the final aqueduct design, and all of the structures along the route. The construction was completed by three to 4,000 immigrants, primarily Irish. Despite the delay to start construction, labor riots, and one failed dam, the construction of the aqueduct took only five years to complete. The Croton Aqueduct was completed on July 4th, 1842. The water took 22 hours to make the journey to the receiving reservoirs in Manhattan, and water became available for public use on October 14th, 1842. Though not everyone immediately trusted the new water, after some time, it changed the lives of New Yorkers forever. Croton water meant clean streets, fresh drinking water, and plumbing for creature comforts previously unimaginable. The aqueduct was named after the river which was dammed for water. Croton's name comes from the name of Chief Kenoton, which means wind. The Croton Aqueduct is 41 miles of continuous horseshoe-shaped tunnel from Croton to Manhattan. This 1843 hydrographic map shows the aqueduct in its grading within the city of New York. The old Croton Aqueduct is a national historic landmark consisting of the surviving above and below ground aspects of the aqueduct through Manhattan, the Bronx, and Westchester counties. The red star indicates the location of the aqueduct walk. The significance of the aqueduct was its use of gravity. When other aqueducts in the country, like Philadelphia's, relied on complicated and expensive pumps to keep water flowing, the Croton Aqueduct relied on gravity alone. To retrieve the gravity-powered water system, the level of the aqueduct depreciated at a rate of 13 inches per mile until it reached Manhattan. This meant that where the grade of the surrounding land was lower than the aqueduct, the embankment, embankment of the aqueduct was visible. In the map above, the thin black line depicts the topography of the city, and the thick red line is the aqueduct tunnel. Where the black line curves below the top of the red line, the aqueduct is above ground level and therefore visible. The aqueduct walk has the most visible sections of the aqueduct tunnel within the city, such as 188th Street pictured above. As seen in the drawings, when the aqueduct tunnel was above ground level, it was covered with an earthen and stone embankment wall. This protected the masonry of the tunnel from the freeze-thaw cycle. Almost immediately after its completion, the embankment atop the aqueduct became a public walkway for New Yorkers. One notable frequenter of the walk was Edgar Allan Poe. He enjoyed walks atop the aqueduct and across the high bridge once it was completed. In 1900, artist Bernard Jacob Rosemeyer drew an image of Poe walking the high bridge. In 1910, the Bronx Society of Arts and Sciences wrote of Poe's beloved walk, no more delightful path can be imagined than the grassy turf above the aqueduct spring. Oxford has her Addison's walk, let New York commemorate Poe's walk. However, it was not just the Society of Arts and Sciences calling for the commemoration of Poe's Walk, but the surrounding communities were advocating for the preservation of the aqueduct walk. In 1903, the community successfully fought a trolley line being placed alongside the aqueduct, which would have disrupted the serenity of this walkway in the developing Bronx. In an open letter to the Times, the author cited the community's objections to the trolley based on their belief in the city beautiful as well as the city prosperous. Then, in 1929, the City Sinking Fund Commission sought to sell the surface rights of the aqueduct walk to developers. The community and residents rallied around this small strip of land, advocating for its salvation and insisting the Parks Department take control of the land. In 1930, the land was transferred to the City Parks Department, largely due to the relentless efforts of the community that cared for it. Following the takeover, the aqueduct walk continued to be an integral part of the community. The Parks Department officially opened the Aqueduct Walk as a park, public park on April 27, 1940. As part of the rehabilitation of the open space, parks installed benches, sand pits, and a playground where the children of the area had historically played, as well as open spaces for adults, such as shuffleboard and horseshoe pits. 
The aqueduct rock has had an evolving relationship with its surrounding areas over its 181 years. When the aqueduct was built, the area of Fordham was sparsely developed. Six feet from the aqueduct's embankment at West Burnside Avenue ran a spring where the people of Fordham got their water. But as Fordham developed and University Heights became its own neighborhood, the city needed more trolley lines. In 1896, the city constructed a marble arch bridge for the trolley to pass underneath the conduit of the aqueduct, cutting through the embankment. This bridge connected East and West Burnside Avenue. But as the area continued to develop, and with over half an American household owning a car, the city needed to widen Burnside Avenue to allow trolleys, cars, and people to pass safely through. In 1930, the city removed the arches, brought the aqueduct underground via an inverted steel siphon, and connected it back through the original aqueduct on the southern side of West Burnside Avenue. Later, in 1940, the city added more retaining walls. The 1842 aqueduct, seen here in blue, served the public well at first. But New York City's population was growing rapidly, and the needs of the public quickly outpaced the ability of the old aqueduct. In 1885, construction began on the new Croton aqueduct, seen here in pink. This line was completed in 1890. At full capacity, the old Croton aqueduct could carry 75 million gallons of water a day. The new Croton aqueduct could carry 340 million gallons of water a day which was enough to keep up with New York City's expanding population, one that had tripled since the completion of the old aqueduct. The High Bridge, New York City's oldest bridge, is the only landmark in New York City connected to the old Croton Aqueduct, though it was completed six years after the construction of the old Croton Aqueduct. The other landmarks of the aqueduct in New York City are connected to the new Croton Aqueduct system, completed in 1890. These landmarks include the new Croton Aqueduct Gatehouse at 135th Street and the 119th Street Gatehouse. The proposed aqueduct walk will be the oldest landmark in New York City associated with the Croton Aqueduct. The section of the aqueduct walk proposed for designation runs between West Kingsbridge Road and West Burnside <laughs> Avenue. In this section, the embankment walls, access points, and sense of place are all intact along the aqueduct trail. The grain line of the surrounding road changes along the walk, giving varying views of the embankment. Parts of the walkway are flush with the roadway, like this section seen here, looking north on West 190th Street up Aqueduct Avenue. At various sections, the grade line of the surrounding streets dips below the level of the aqueduct, so the walkway is elevated, like this section below West 190th Street. Above West Fordham Road, it is possible to walk alongside the student embankment wall. Below West 180th Street, the earthen cover is visible. On University Avenue, the city embankment walls circa 1940 are visible. At the terminus of the walk at West Burnside Avenue, the top of the walk is 130 feet above street level. This is the highest point of the walk. At West Burnside Avenue, the city's 1930s and 1940s changes to the wall, where the aqueduct tunnel was brought underground via siphon, are still visible. The park has many entrances, including recently updated accessible ramps where the walk is at grade level, ramps to higher elevations, updated stairs at historic locations, and historic stairs which have proposed renovations to replace them with an accessible ramp. Reflecting the park's long history of community use, the Parks Department has added various amenities in recent years at the southern end of the landmark site, such as additional play spaces, seating areas, and accessible entrances. These do not detract from the intact and historically significant elements of the 1842 aqueduct visible in the park. In 2018, just north of the playgrounds and the basketball courts, between West 181st Street and West 183rd Street, the Parks Department constructed a comfort station. This contemporary structure does not contribute to the significance of the Croton Aqueduct and will not be included in the landmark site. The Croton Aqueduct was the first direct water source to New York City. It was long sought after and hard won. The aqueduct was a life-sustaining, gravity-powered engineering marvel constructed by immigrants, which allowed the city to continue to develop at an explosive rate through the 19th century. After its construction, the walkway atop the aqueduct became a beloved path and open place for New Yorkers in the rapidly developing city. Due to its incredibly layered significance, the research department recommends that the Landmarks Preservation Commission votes to calendar the old Croton Aqueduct for consideration as the Bronx's first scenic landmark. Thank you.
All right. Any questions, Commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. So this is this is great, and I could go on about the New York City water supply system, which is a bit of an obsession. But I have one question: When you look at the plan, the park seems to continue south of Burnside. Why wasn't that included? I can take this one, Sarah. We we looked at the the whole um, boundary of the park, and what our boundary derives from is the actual blocks and lots and the the park's mapped park. Um, south of Burnside Avenue, there's a long portion where the visibility of the aqueduct is no longer present, and it's also not really accessible. So there's a part of the park that kind of is a pause in a way, and then below that is a more contemporary playground. So in terms of focusing on the real um, visible portions of the aqueduct primarily, and then also the public experience of the walkway led us to this landmark site. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum, no? Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, well, this is, again, we've been working uh, closely with the Parks Department on this, and um, and they have been incredibly supportive. Um, and so this is really exciting. I think this is um, such an important part of infrastructure in the city and really so critical to the history and the development of the city. And the fact that it, you know, throughout the 20th century has been so um, celebrated and uh, advocated for by the community is also sort of like an interesting layer to this public space. Um, and, and, you know, we, of course, would be really interested in the pathway and how it relates to the aqueduct and uh, similar to some of the other linear scenic landmarks that we have, like Coney Island Boardwalk or the parkways, Eastern Parkway and Ocean Parkway. Um, but what is really exciting to me is this would be technically designated as the first scenic landmark in the Bronx. So excited about that. So if, yes, Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, yeah I, I want to just echo that and, you know, Highline Schmeiline. I think we, we had it first and um, it's a <laughs> remarkable uh, uh, designation. I mean, for, for, for me, the, the question I have in my head is like, you know, what are our goals as a commission you know, work with parks over time with this. And I think that the, 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 the points that Kate and you just mentioned, the, the focus on both the artifact of the exposed um, stone walls, uh, the walkway experience, the linear experience um, are, are kind of interesting focuses. I'm a little concerned about, you know, it is a parks department space that is protected. So, you know, what are our goals? But I think that I think over time that'll kind of develop and um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, over time, uh, enhance the experience of this really, really cool uh, piece of New York history. Yeah, and I, I think, uh... I think with our, uh, you know, our designation, we would be able to influence that. And as we know, with all parks, there will be efforts to make it accessible. There will have to be, as there have been historically, changes to entryways and um, also some of the public amenity spaces. But, I, you know, I'm confident that this commission can review those and manage those in a way that preserves and enhances the experience. Yes. Commissioner Chen, do you want to add something? Just one thing about the staff. This is uh, when my work is uh, engineering model. You know, so much of this, uh, the development of the city is tied to what, what was achieved here in, in relatively short time. And we think about stretching just for this actual implementation is only five years. So it's, it's amazing. We need to get back to that speed in the city. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Okay, this is great. Yes, Commissioner Jeffers. I must agree. I was in the Bronx about a year ago, and I'm driving around, and I see this thing, and I say, what is this? And now I, now you know. That's, really <laughs> That's great. Terrific. Okay, so if we all agree, we'll go ahead and make a motion to calendar it. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to calendar this item? So, and Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyway. aye. 
Oh, Commissioner Chapin, I'm sorry. I think you wanted to add something. Please go ahead. Sorry. I uh, yeah, my my uh, connection is in and out. Um, I just wanted to uh, say uh, this is an incredibly important designation, I think, uh, because the history, as was reflected in the research of uh, clean water for New York is such, such an important thing to any major city uh, and around the world continues to be an issue for many, many people. And uh, this is just this is just a great thing. And I also uh, wanted to say that I think uh, we should in the designation reference that additional portion uh, in the event that at some time it is possible to uh, include more of it uh, if you know the topography changes in the future, which we don't know what would happen, but just so that it's on record that uh, more of it might be included at some future date, possibly. Yes, we, we, we can definitely, I think the whole designation would talk about the entire history and the entire span yeah. and the question that we would be considering. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Chapin. So I think we all agreed to calendar it if there's no opposition. And I don't hear any opposition. I think this is officially calendared. So thank you all. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for your work. And uh, Kate, thank you for your leadership on all of these designations. All right, we'll now move to the Preservation Department agenda. And I'll turn it over to Corey Harala, our Director of Preservation. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. We'll start today's Preservation Department agenda with public hearing items. First is public hearing item number one. LPC 24-00053. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Queens. 82, lot 25, 39-8844th Street in the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District. This is a simplified colonial revival style row house designed by Clarence Stein and Henry Wright and built in 1927. And the application is to install a retaining wall and patio and create an opening in a masonry wall. Good morning, Commissioners. Leanne Pollock, Preservation Staff. This item is 3988 44th Street, Queens. Uh, the owner is seeking to legalize ongoing work at their side yard with some modifications. The side yard condition at designation is seen in the photo on the right. The house is located at the end of the mews that stretches between 43rd Street and 44th Street and is at the western boundary of the historic district. The row of houses is oriented perpendicular to the street, so the side yard actually faces onto 43rd Street. The owner began grading the side yard and constructing a brick retaining wall without a permit and received a violation. They are now seeking approval for a set of wooden steps from the front yard to the side yard, which was built by the prior owner, and you can see um, just here. The brick retaining wall with a patio and planting area on the top level and brick and limestone steps to the patio from the patio to the lower yard. That those have not been constructed yet, but they would be located right there. Uh, the retaining wall is currently 38 inches, but the owner is proposing to lower it to 30 inches in order to avoid the need to install a railing. They are also seeking approval to create an opening in the brick wall um, adjacent to their house to the rear, approximately there. Um, so they can access the patio from their rear yard. The subject building is circled in red on this original Madison Court planning document. I want to note that this house is located next to a long line of garages to the north, seen here, uh, and that there's only one other house on 43rd Street right here with a similar orientation to the subject property. The row of houses to the south, uh, down here, have also seen installation of multiple curb cuts and paved driveways. So this is a bit of a unique condition for the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District. The sloped grassy side yard condition present at designation through at least 2017 is seen in the street view photo on the right. Between 2017 and 2020, the prior owner installed a wooden retaining wall and steps from the front yard to the side yard. When the current owner purchased the property, the retaining wall was beginning to buckle from improper drainage and support, creating an unsafe condition at the side yard. 
Here you can see the proposed side yard plan, noting uh, the existing wood steps here, uh, new proposed steps here, and the retaining wall here with the patio uh, in the gray color and then a small planting bed uh, in green, and then the proposed opening from the rear yard to the side yard there. This plan shows a little additional context. The neighboring building, as you can see, already has a non-historic side addition, which was constructed prior to designation. Uh, and the retaining wall at 3988 doesn't project any further from the house towards the sidewalk than that side addition already does. There are also common access steps that lead from the common mews at the front of the house and the common driveway at the rear of the house um, that come down to sidewalk level. Here's where the owner proposes a cut through at the wall to provide access to the rear yard, between the rear yard and the side yard. They propose to install a wooden gate with a dark stained finish at this opening to keep with the dark finish of the masonry. A few of the current condition photos are seen here. When issued a violation, the owner immediately stopped work and began to work with landmarks to address the violation. In terms of material, they've used brick for the wall and propose a cementitious paver with a dark blue stone finish at the patio. Uh, the photo in the lower right shows a similar paver, but this is lighter in color than what's proposed. Here you can see the building within the streetscape context, including the garages to the north and the addition on the house to the south that's outlined in the red dotted line. Uh, noting that when these photos were taken, the retaining wall had already been installed and is covered in plastic. You can just kind of barely see it through the plantings and railing over here. Um, obviously, when it's done, the plastic will be removed and it'll just be a, a brick wall. Some additional photos, including showing the warehouses that are located across the street, across 43rd Street from the subject building down here. Um, and then the paved driveways and curb cuts and fencing that's located at the row of houses to the south. <laughs> there are many precedents for the use of brick retaining walls throughout Sunnyside Gardens, particularly in locations where these muse buildings meet the street. Here, down here, and this tax photo here um, are historic images of the 44th Street side of the row of buildings where the subject property is located. You can just see 3988 is down at this opposite end here. Um, you can see how there were historic brick retaining walls there and they're still present today. There are also many examples of paving in front and side yards throughout the district. And there are a variety of paving types present. The commission has also previously approved paving um, in yards in the district, uh, particularly at this house on 47th Street. Um, the paving has been installed in this image, but it's screened pretty well by landscaping, so you can't really get a good, a good view of it. And that concludes the presentation and the owner, Peter Cooper is here and would like to say a few final remarks and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Mr. Cooper, please come up and state your name. And uh add anything you'd like all right i hope it works hello everyone peter cooper together with my wife uh the homeowner since april last year um of that house first of all sincere apologies for the violation that was definitely not intentional at all if i would have known better i would have filed an application and uh uh yeah not caused all of this fuss and delays on on our end um I thought at the time, did my research, we talked talk to the neighbors that lived there up to 40 years. They all said, well, it's in the side yard. It's not one of the protected area yards. It's only a retaining wall. There already is a retaining wall. I got three different contractors that worked in the area. They all said, no, this doesn't need any landmark approval. So misinformation, sorry for that. Uh, it was great to work with Leanne. We stopped work right away after uh, we got the violation letter. Uh, by email and and of course uh, worked with her and, and and you guys to make it happen. Um, when we moved in, one of the reasons we bought the house was that side yard, the rear yard, and the front yard. At that house is unique; it doesn't have any green area. 
It's both basically paved already. So the main green space is actually the side yard. We have two little kids. That's why we said are oh, perfect. We have that side yard, but with the slope condition, or as you saw the previously by the previous owner installed retaining wall that was not properly built, falling apart. The upper parts were rotten. They were, I don't know, installed 30 years ago. It was also not a safe and usable side yard for kids. That's why uh, we decided to move fairly quickly one year later and install that big retaining wall. We wanted, we bought that. We love Sunnyside Gardens. We lived there five years before uh, my wife there. And so we picked that area, looked for a house there. So we appreciate the landmark uh, preservation. That's why we took a lot of effort in selecting the bricks, made sure the end shows it doesn't extend any further than any other houses. It fits in with the with the neighborhood as good as possible. Um, the break through the, the, the door that on, on the left side, we didn't, that there was not planned to do it because that was clear for us. Okay, this is a landmark protected wall. So if we want to do a breakthrough, that would definitely have needed application. So we knew that. That's why we didn't plan that work. Now, as we anyway went through the process, um, yeah, we would highly appreciate if that would be um, approved. Also, reason from the front yard, you have to exit the main door first. So the kids would go in the common yard area before you access the garden. So we always will have to join them with the wood step at the, at the side. They are great, but it's 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 not um, yeah accessible. Let's say if within the boundaries of the house, so that the kids can just go in and out and play. So therefore, it would be awesome um, if we can do that breakthrough um, to the rear really yard, basically. Yeah, I think that was my additional remarks and short introduction. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? Just for, for staff. Yes, Commissioner Goldman. Staff, staff note uh, indicated uh, railing uh, that was proposed. Uh, they're, the, they're proposing to lower the height of the retaining wall so that a railing would not be required. So right now it's 38 inches high, which would require a railing for DOB. They're going to remove um, some oh, okay. sources of brick to get it down to 30 inches so that a railing is no longer so that required. comment would not be, would not be uh, required at this time. Correct. I read that as, is there a wood railing and stair? Yes. So um, there is over here um, at the existing wood um, set of steps that come from the front door down to the side yard. It's the wood railing and wood steps that were constructed by the prior owner. So the steps uh, that they're seeking to legalize are the wood steps that she, uh, you were uh, mentioning, Commissioner Goldblum, and with a wood railing. And those you were saying don't come down directly from your front, your private front yard. It comes down from the common space. They they come down from the private front yard, but the front yard is accessible through a gate to the common yard. So you have to exit the main entrance of the house first, and you're in the common yard area that is accessible also to the main streets. And then there's a small gate to the right of it to access the front yard. So therefore, the kids would always go outside of the house first. And then I see. not, so not to stay in the fenced area of the property. Let, let me say it that way, maybe. So why not just move the stair to the left? So that it's in your property. Um, well, on the left, the wall is significantly higher. You, no, 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 move the stair right now that way so that it, it, the exit is from your front yard and not from the public oh. front yard. Yeah. So there is no fence around their front yard. It's it's open to the common area. So I, I think what he's saying is that when you walk out the front door, you're in their front yard, but it's easy enough to run into the common open space and then access the streets kind of on either side. So there there isn't. Let, uh, let's see if we can. Uh, I guess I'm just confused about if if the stair in the front is something that you're going to you, you you're saying that the, the front stair is kind of not as good because it's kind of in the public area and that's why you want the back door. Am I, do I have that right? Yes. So why keep the front steps in the first place? 
they, they were there. So ideally, we can keep them. I mean, it's nice that it's not, uh, they, they were installed by the previous office. Right. Uh, if I would have bought the property without it, I would have right away got it on the other yard. Super. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Um, I, yes, Commissioner Jefferson. On the drawing, um, the real drawing where you propose to make the opening, right? In the real yard, where you propose to make the opening. Yeah. Don't you need stairs there also? So, right. So, where, so that's going to right, come out to a lower grade? Is your rear yard at a lower grade? Uh, it, it might be a difference, I measured it, of a few inches. So it would not be a step. It might be that you basically go out there, and, and but it's a natural step. So you don't need additional steps. It, it might go down after the rain six, seven inches. But once you cut the opening, mm -hmm. everything would be flat. Would the uh, same inch wall as it did now? It would uh, be about that. With a 30 inch wall there, without the railing, it's like basically seven inches, I think, roughly level difference. So oh, thank you. You, you, you. So your grade in your rear yard is approximately where you're retaining the, the, uh, the earth that's retained is, will be in terms of. Yes, earth. roughly. Okay. All right, and other questions? Okay, let's see if we have any public testimony. Is there anyone in the room who would like to testify on this item? Not seeing anyone in the room, I will turn it over to Gregory Powell to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. I do not see any hands raised currently in our attendee list. If you would like to speak on this item, please click the raise hand button right now. Okay, I do not see any hands raised. And so I will bring it back to you, Chair Carol. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so commissioners, if there are no final questions, we'll make a motion to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Thank you, Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion now about um, changes to this side yard, which um, really is at the boundary of the historic district because it's at the boundary of the original planned um, garden and, and homes and gardens on a, a kind of a double, a two-way street. So it really uh, on this street does feel like an edge and a back condition to the historic district. This yard, as Leanne pointed out in the presentation, uh, is not part of a consistent row. There are garages to the north. Um, there is another yard to the south, which has an addition that comes out um, further than the retaining wall on, that is proposed. And then it has uh, houses that face the street, many of which have paved front yards and fences. Um, and these are also very uh, sort of overgrown and so much of the visibility through vegetation. So the proposal uh, before us today is to legalize that stair that comes around to the front to uh, construct a 30-inch retaining wall with a planted area next to it and a paved surface at the rest remaining portion of the retained earth um, and to replant the surrounding area and then to create an opening and masonry wall to the backyard. Um, and so we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? <clears throat> Commissioner Chapin? Hello. Hi. Hi, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I've been going in and out. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I think that this is uh, totally approvable. I think that... Um, the retaining wall is is really needed and lowering it will help. And uh, it's very, as was shown in the presentation, uh, the, this is a, uh, has a lot of precedent in uh, that type of retaining wall in the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District. And the use of the bluestone on the patio is nice. And it's not, you know, it's also typical to see, you know, small patios and that kind of thing in the district. 
I think even the the door, I think it's a minimal intervention. And I think that uh, it, it is really quite appropriate and will not call attention to itself. So I think that that uh, could be permitted as well. So I, I really could uh, approve this as presented as appropriate uh, within this historic district and uh, similar to things in other parts of the district. Thank you. Let's go ahead. Commissioner Chapin has um, explained her position very well. I support everything she said, uh, including the new door in the wall, which I think is a minimal intervention in the historic fabric. Otherwise, uh, its condition on the edge of the historic district, I think, is um, uh, helps um, legitimize this uh, new, new situation. So I'm fine with it as presented. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. I I approve that. I agree with my fellow commissioners and, and their comments. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I, I agree as well. I, I just would propose uh, uh, that they remove that front stair, which um, doesn't seem to be a particular hardship and certainly isn't original. And uh, I think it'll uh, it clean it up. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ginsburg? Well, I lived in Sunnyside Gardens a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and this is, there's always the issue of private space versus shared public space. And I think this is a reasonable solution and appropriate. Commissioner Chen? I agree as well. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi? I agree, it's appropriate. Okay, so I think we have enough to approve it as is. And um, I think I'll go ahead and make that motion. So, matter of docket number 24 0005339 Street in the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District, a simplified colonial revival style roadhouse designed by Clarence Stein and Henry Lowe and built in 1927. This is an application to install a retaining wall and patio and create an opening in a masonry wall. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, details, and siting are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District. I recommend approval that the uh, finding that the construction of the retaining wall did not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features of the site or the building. That the building is oriented perpendicular to 43rd Street between a row of garages and a non historic side yard at the outer edge of the historic district, which lacks a consistent streetscape context, and therefore the work will not diminish a uniform row house condition. That the brick and limestone materials of the retaining wall and the proposed steps will be compatible with the style materials and finishes of the house and will be consistent with the design and materials of other historic retaining walls and stoops found throughout the streetscape and the historic district. That the proposed patio will be set back from the sidewalk and will not be will not substantially eliminate or reduce the presence of green space at the yard that the cementitious pavers at the patio will be tinted to approximate the color of bluestone, which is consistent with other hardscape materials found in the historic district, and the scale and pattern of pavings will not be perceptible from the street, uh, that the opening through the historic perimeter masonry wall from the other room yard um, will be a minimal post intervention that will not eliminate significant historic fabric or distract from it or detract from the continuous uh, rear yard wall condition. Um, and that the uh, stair um, installed without permits um, will be visible through vegetation and um, also will not detract from a uniform condition and therefore. Um, I recommend approval. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. And John, will you call the vote? The Chair Carroll. Aye. Vice Chair Brand. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. 
Uh, Commissioner Holford Smith. I'm not sure if he's here. She's not here yet. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutby. Aye. Uh, eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you. Um, but, and while we did support it as is, um, you know, please continue to think about that wood fence in the front. And if you do find that you don't need it, removing it, I think would be welcome by all. Yeah, I mean, it's approved as is, but if you find you don't need it, would welcome the removal. All right. Okay, thank you. All right. We'll move to the next item. The next item is public hearing item number two. LPC 24-00822, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1264, lot five, one Rockefeller Plaza, AKA one through 15 Rockefeller Plaza, 15 to 19 West 48th Street, 14 to 20 West 49th Street, one Rockefeller Plaza, originally time and life building individual landmark. This is an art deco style office tower designed by a consortium of architects known as the Associated Architects with portions designed by a group of fine artists. 1936 to 37. The application is to renew the temporary installation of an outdoor seating enclosure. Okay, so before you begin, I just want to note for the record that Commissioner Goldman was recused on this item. And so um, at this time, we have five commissioners present. We have two who are participating remotely, but we uh, are required to have a quorum in person in order to take an action. So uh, we would welcome the presentation today and we can ask questions, but we won't be able to vote today. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Sarah Ripple, Higgins Quays Black and Partners. I believe we have E.B. Kelly from Tishman Spire on the Zoom call to make an introduction, if she's able to be patched through. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. And uh, apologies for not being with you all in, in person, but I uh, had some on-site matters here at, at Rockefeller Center with some of our folks who are here and in the office. Uh, always nice to see our office customers present. So um, with, with that, let me, um, let me just begin and, and thank you all again for, for having us this morning. Um, we're, we're here today to talk about um, uh, a restaurant, uh, Lodi, and, and the enclosure associated with it. Um, and, and to put this into a little bit of context, this is a restaurant that opened at Rockefeller Center in 2021, um, which in looking back um, felt like a little bit of an audacious time to think about opening a new restaurant in the middle of Midtown during COVID. Um, and this is a restaurant that has really navigated uh, the challenges of COVID. They opened and, and nearly instantly were hit with um, the, the challenges of Omicron. Then we've had the variety of sort of return to office timing as expected, not as expected, um, and really is an important part of the, the ecosystem that we're looking to create here at Rockefeller Center to support in, in the recovery of Midtown. Um, because this restaurant sort of said it's important to, to plant the flag and open now and be part of really bringing um, Midtown back and be part of the recovery, it has had to adapt and change and the business plan of the restaurant has really needed to evolve to meet the needs of the market. And as such, Really, the business viability of the restaurant depends on having consistency in booking the seats in the outdoor terrace, those seats um, enabling reservations, planning ahead, large group booking. It's really core to, to retaining the, the jobs associated with this restaurant and to keeping the, the restaurant as, as a going concern. As you all well know from the many conversations that, that we've had um, and discussions we've had together, 
Rockefeller Center really remains committed to helping the city emerge from the pandemic, committed to the recovery of Midtown, to supporting the city and its efforts um, to bring back that vibrancy and, and enabling this restaurant to, to continue um, in its operation is really a key part of that effort. So um, many thanks again, and, and I'll turn it back to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Evie. Um, as the director introduced, and as EB has explained, this is a proposal to retain, see, proposal to retain the existing exterior fabric enclosure located at the base of one Rockefeller Plaza. You can see in the left-hand photo, the grand tower of one Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, it's a 36-story building finished in 1936, um, overlooking uh, the Sunken Plaza and Rockefeller Plaza, the pedestrian walkway, um, and Caddy Corner from uh, 30 Rockefeller Plaza here on your right. Um, and noted in the Rockefeller Center campus plan um, here at the southeast corner of West 49th Street and Rockefeller Plaza, um, one rock is outlined in red here, and that area where the enclosure is located is in yellow right here. Um, it was installed, as mentioned, under temporary installation approval as a solution to operational needs for the restaurant that entered during the COVID pandemic, as Ms. Kelly described. It was designed and built to be truly reversible without any effect on the building. Uh, the size is deferential to the storefront rhythm and the sidewalk context and occupies just 45 feet out of 400 feet of frontage of the building. Um, within the street context, we hope you'll find that the finish recedes into the activity at the sidewalk. It's actually in the photograph here at the base of the building. Um, and we'll hope that you agree that this enclosure placed at the base of this building, um, that its scale arrangement details and finish do not detract from the wonderful historic character of Rockefeller Center and one Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, so a street view looking south with your back to the Sunken Plaza, um, the activity of Rockefeller Plaza and 10 Rock, and the Today Show immediately to your right, right here. Um, this is the fabric enclosure as it exists today. A similar design, a little bit of background information, a similar design was installed early in the pandemic under a temporary permit that was removed. And then a subsequent temporary approval was granted still in the midst of the pandemic for this specific design. Um, the prominent feature on this facade is this 49th Street entrance to the building um, and carved and painted artwork. Uh, the vibrance and scale of this entry is well removed from the enclosure um, and retains its prominence on the elevation. The rest of the base is the repeated storefronts um, with matching dimensions, details, and sign bands. And you'll note that the, uh, the height of the enclosure rests below the sign bands and is set off from the building. So the limestone piers can continue to be read, um, as is that rhythm of uh, storefronts is, is maintained. Um, it's also located on a very deep sidewalk. Um, and is further set back from the pathway by these existing granite planters that we'll see closer up in a minute. Um, it just seems tucked into the corner, uh, given all of the uh, kind of sighting on the corner. The, these are the conditions prior to the arrival of the restaurant, um, which occupies the first storefront on 49th Street and three storefront windows along the plaza. Um, in this top left photo, you see 49th Street and the plaza elevations together, that consistent line of storefronts marching down the facade, um, the almost double height uh, level of the base with these mezzanine windows on the plaza, built-in granite planters in each of the photos um, with integrated flagpoles, which is a typical part of that streetscape um, surrounding the sunken plaza and then some additional planters on casters and benches. Uh, so in 1985, and this photo on the left, uh, at the time of designation, we see the street, um, the sunken plaza, one and one rock from an elevated location, and you really get a sense of scale for this tower. Um, you see the full composition of the building with the bands of limestone and windows really accentuating the verticality. Um, then the double height base at the bottom, um, below that, the storefront, level and below that is the location of the proposed enclosure. So getting a sense of scale for the building and where that enclosure really fits in within it. Um, at the right are the primary entrances to One Rock, um, located on its three frontages at 49th Street, um, the plaza and 48th Street. 
Um, the size and depth of these openings are punctuated by their larger than life size art pieces, um, which we feature painted colors and gilding to really draw your attention. Um, these entries and their artwork really represent the most significant exterior features at the base of the building, which is otherwise kind of described as a more simple building within the Rockefeller Center complex. Um, and each of these entries is um, separated from the enclosure and kind of maintains its, um, its prominence. Uh, an example of temporary enclosure is seen here in both 1939 on the left and 2023 um, on the right, highlighting how this is a continuing tradition at, at the center. On the right, the fabric enclosure under review is actually in place, and it's a little hard to see, um, but it's receding into the background, but located um, immediately within the context of the activity and energy of both Rockefeller Plaza and the sunken plaza here in the foreground. So an overall plan of the first floor of One Rock, um, the plaza is at your right, um, and the uh, 49th Street entry here at the bottom, um, and the 48th Street entry uh, up here at the top, just to situate yourself. Um, the restaurant uh, occupies this first um, interior space along the plaza. Um, and it, as I mentioned, the building has 405 feet of frontage and the uh, enclosure, which uh, occupies the space, space on 49th Street, um, measures at just 45 feet. You'll also note the granite, ex existing granite planters uh, dividing the sidewalk area. Sorry, I can't seem to get it to move forward. Which I have seen in the arrow. It's not moving. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can have. Abby, taking over control of the screen and. Uh, <laughs> okay. oh. Abby, just checking to see if you're uh, trying to put the presentation deck back up. Sarah, can you try again? It's not advancing. Can you control from your end? And we'll just yes. have Sarah advance. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Abby. Um, yes. Next slide, please. So looking at a detailed plan of what we saw earlier in the photographs, simply just the existing granite planters aligning with the limestone piers of the building um, and the additional, additional movable planters. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, an installation plan. The fabric enclosure, the boundaries of the fabric enclosure are highlighted in yellow. As mentioned, the overall size is about 45 feet by 15 feet. Um, you'll note that it's defined by the limit, limit of the existing granite planters and set back from their edges by a foot and a half. 
Um, as noted, it is truly reversible. It is not fastened or attached to the building or even the paving or granite planters in any way. It's held in place by steel plates hidden under the planters on casters. Next slide, please. In elevation, matching also what we saw in previous photos, it's clad in a recessive dark color umbrella fabric, similar in tone to the storefronts with clear flip-up windows. The overall height is nine feet at the inside and eight foot eight inches at the outside with that gentle slope of the roof, providing a clear reading of the historic sign ban and limestone piers at the building. At the front edge, the main body does not project beyond the line of the taller flagpoles, all of this contributing to it visually being secondary to the building and the sidewalk. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, a space was left, you'll see in the top left detail, that a space was left between the enclosure and the building to be free of the limestone, save for a protected neoprene strip at the roof. Um, the bottom detail shows how those steel plates slide under the movable planters, and the photos on the right are illustrating the overall height and detailing as it exists today. Um, you can see the storefront and masonry pier actually through the, the clear windows of the enclosure. Next, please. So just to take a step back as we conclude, um, look at it within the larger streetscape of Rockefeller Center, this is a small part of a large campus sitting alongside the busy pedestrian plaza and directly facing the sunken plaza, the heart of Rockefeller Center. It's tucked into the corner away from the main entry of the building, secondary to the storefront openings and the double height base. Um, the color scale positioning and details all seemingly allow it to recede and not call attention to itself while still serving a very important function for this restaurant and contributing to the activity of the sidewalk and the center as a whole. Um, next slide, please. Two more uh, on the left, looking west down 49th Street towards the plaza, you get a sense for how much it's set back from the street, nestled within the existing planters below the line of the storefronts, flagpoles, and overall scale of the towers surrounding it, and across from the vibrancy of the activities and gathering place of the second plaza. And in the right photo, looking from in front of 30 Rockefeller Center, Ro Rockefeller Plaza, um, kind of seeing that it reads very much uh, here, I'm pointing it out as a small part of the much larger overall context. Next slide, please. So to just wrap up, um, this is a truly reversible installation occupying a small portion of the building's frontage, diminutive in scale to the building and its surrounding buildings and finished in dimension to be recessive and deferential overall. It fits well within the context of this vibrant and active street life of Rockefeller Center. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? It's Commissioner Ginsburg. I have one. They're asking for a six year extension. Uh, legally, can we say six years, but if the restaurant closes, that they would have to reapply? I, I think that's reasonable. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay, um, so just uh, well, let's see if we have any testimony. Is there anyone in the room who would like to speak on this item? All right, not seeing anyone in the room, I'll turn it over to Gregory to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. If you are in the meeting and you would like to speak on this item, please click the raise hand button now. Okay. I do not see any hands raised in our attendees list, so I will bring it back to you, Chair Carol. Okay, thank you. So, um, as was described, the staff had issued a permit for a temporary installation. The rules allow the staff to or authorize the staff to approve temporary installations for up to a year. And um, there is no, in that rule, there is no criteria or requirement that they, that the installation be appropriate under our normal standards. Really, the requirement under the rule is that the installation is easily reversible and that the applicant has submitted a time schedule for its removal. And so the staff found that this met those rules. There was a plan and time schedule for um, the, the installation and its removal, and as was presented, the installation is not attached to the building. It and 
um, not cause any damage to significant historic fabric. Um, because the applicants are seeking a longer temporary term, they also talked a lot about its relationship to the building and to the plaza. Uh, to put it into some context for us. And so they would uh, like to extend the uh, length of the temporary installation. And uh, again, unfortunately, we can't act today because we don't have a quorum present. Um, but should we um, get a quorum later in the afternoon, uh, we may be able to revisit it. So um, we'll thank you for the presentation now and we'll reconvene as quickly as we can. All right, thank you. All right, next item. All right, we'll now move to public hearing item number three, LPC 23-07299. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1253, lot 7503, 230 Riverside Drive in the Riverside West End Historic District Extension 2. Uh, this is a medie medieval revival style apartment building designed by Charles H. Lynch and built 1930 to 31. And the application is to replace windows. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the Zoom hearing. Rebecca, I'm going to give you control of the presentation. Please just click on your screen, Great, and then you can pass you. the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. So uh, my name is Rebecca Levin. Um, I'm here with RL Architectural Services, and my presentation is on behalf of uh, the apartment owner at 230 Riverside Drive, apartment 6K. Um, so a little bit about uh, this building that we're presenting today. Uh, this is um, part of the Riverside West End Historic District. Um, this is a large 18-story apartment building. Uh, it's located at the corner of Riverside Drive and West 95th Street. Um, it was erected in 1930. The architect was uh, Charles Hench. Um, and uh, this application is in regards to the window replacement. So uh, if you could see here on the left side, um, the large scale apartment building here, the original windows, which you can't see too well in this tax photograph. Um, but if you look here to the right, you can see a little bit of this building. Um, the original windows were uh, steel multi-light casements. And if we go to the building now, um, you can see that the majority of the windows are now aluminum one over one double hungs without divided lights. Um, of the primary facades on West End, I'm sorry, on Riverside Drive and West 95th Street, there's approximately 693 windows, only 4% of which are still the original multi-light casements. Um, if we, the slides aren't forwarding. The slides aren't advancing, um, unfortunately. Um, so apartment, If you could see this. Rebecca, just hold for a second while we try to get the uh, okay. slide deck back up. Thank you. Great. Rebecca, if you just want to tell me when to advance the slides, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Um, so th this building here is a similar style building in, in the area. It's actually pretty uncommon, uh, this, this medieval style, the revival in this area. Um, but this is one that can be found. It's 120 Riverside Drive. And as you can see in this building and originally, these were also all one over one double hungs. You could go to the next slide. 
So this is apartment 6K. As you can see, there's only five window openings here. Um, and they all face West 95th Street. You could go to the next slide. Um, so at the top is exactly what it looks like now. They still have the original steel multi-light casements. And what we're proposing is aluminum one over one double hungs all to match the rest of the building um, and what's there now. Uh, so with that, you'll, you'll have more consistency throughout the building. Um, the reason why the owners are looking to replace these windows is because the existing are in terrible condition. Um, they barely operate. They're all single pane windows, whereas the new proposed windows will be energy efficient. Um, and a, a frame to, a, I'm sorry, a brick to brick installation. So you won't get any drafts. Um, you could go to the next slide. Um, so that kind of just shows what we're proposing. If you go to the next slide. Um, so the on the right is the um, the vertical detail of the aluminum double hung. You could go to the next slide and the next slide. So this shows um, this shows the primary facades and when you step back, you really can't see what type of windows are present through the building, but the majority of them are aluminum double hungs now. I've kind of highlighted where you could still see some of the original uh, steel casements, which is really not a lot of them. So, um, so yeah, you could go to the next slide. So this shows uh, some of the secondary facades, which you can't see too well, but you, you can see the upper floors. As you can see, there's really not many of the original steel casements left. You could go to the next slide. And this is the other secondary facade uh, that's facing north. Um, you can just see a few of them there. And that really concludes the presentation. Um, yeah, well, they're looking for the uh, the single single light double hungs here. Okay, thank you, commissioners. Do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. I have two. Were the double hungs done after the building was designated? Was the designation? So not that not that we know of. Um, I'm not seeing. I wasn't seeing any anything on record. Um, I think a, the majority of these windows were replaced prior to designation uh, with the aluminum double hungs, uh, but this is how it stands now. I'm not sure if anyone did them without landmark approval, but um, we're not seeing anything. Right. Yeah, there, there have not been any staff level reviews or approvals of replacement windows on the primary facades, only on setbacks or secondary facades that I would assume are not visible or minimally visible. <laughs> And then my second question is, I you talked about energy efficiency and replacement casement windows would be more efficient than double hungs. I realize you're, it was the only justification of not replacing with casements that the predominance in the building is now double hung. Correct, correct. Uh, they're looking to create consistency with the majority of the other windows. I wouldn't say that new casements wouldn't be as energy efficient as double hungs, um, but the the existing are steel and they're all single pane. So you have zero energy efficiency now, um, but the new double hungs would, would give you that. All right, other questions? Um, I just yes, Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, just along the lines of the energy efficiency. So these windows are going to meet um, the requirements of Local Law 97. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, not seeing any questions at this time. Um, I think we'll move to public testimony. And uh, is there anyone in this room who would like to speak on this item? Okay, so uh, we're going to turn it over to Gloria Ricola to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We received a couple of signups in advance for this item. So the first we'll be hearing from is Landmark West. 
Landmark West, I'll be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and say your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Landmark West, are you with us? Hello, Commissioners. Megan Fitzpatrick speaking on behalf of Landmark West. Um, the Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee appreciates the desire for uniformity and energy efficient windows. With so many windows already replaced with variants, what is one more apartment it is a further degradation of the original fabric. Our committee recognizes this application offers an opportunity for the building to establish a master plan hinged upon exploring ideas to retain the historic character of the remaining multi-light windows. According to the applicant's survey, approximately eight to 10 apartments retain the original multi-light steel casement windows. What is the fate of the remaining historic windows and what can be done about the further erosion of historic features like these? With thoughtful consideration and creativity, we believe that a more sympathetic design, the fitting of the landmark, can be standardized for a future cohesion that is in keeping with the original design intent. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recommends a master plan and further discussion about the retention of historic character of the historic character of this building regarding its windows. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I'll be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, we'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this proposal to be inappropriate. We are aware and appreciate that most of this building's original windows have been replaced with one over ones, but consistency is not a substitute for preservation. The purpose of designation is to look to the long-term, and the long-term goal is the restoration and stewardship of these structures. Given the likelihood that all of the windows on this building are going to have to be replaced within the next 20 to 40 years, we believe this application can set a precedent for future window replacements in this building. HTC contends that an appropriate solution for this application and those in the future is an energy efficient window that preserves or recalls in some way the historic window munching configuration. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much for your testimony. I am looking through our attendees list now. I do not see any further hands raised. So I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 7's Landmark Committee recommends approval with a strong recommendation for a future master plan. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carol. All right, thank you very much. So I'd like to turn back to the applicant and ask if you would like to respond to the comments we heard. Well, I, I don't completely disagree, but uh, the building, unfortunately, uh, has has not gone forward with a master plan. And we did propose that option to them, um, but we can't, unfortunately, make them create a master plan uh, for steel casements or for uniformity in the building. They're leaving it to the owners to uh, apply one by one. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, any final questions? All right, let's move to close the hearing. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Goldman, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And as we have, you know, we review these applications, these kinds of applications a lot. Um, and as we know, we cannot compel a property owner to uh, create a propose a master plan for the building. We strongly encourage it always because 
it really is an, uh, the, a master plan under our rules and regulations is really a, a tool for property owners so that each apartment doesn't have to come in and go through a lengthy process um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And the uh, master plan allows the staff to issue much more quickly in a staff level approval for an approved prototype without requiring all the additional drawings and materials that we normally require. And so it allows for a strict, more streamlined process. And so we really do encourage owners to take advantage of that um, tool that we have. But short of that, we are faced with looking at um, this building on an apartment by apartment basis. And we're looking at this particular apartment um, and as we've discussed a lot in the past, the commission has a long history of reviewing um, windows in large apartment buildings on both the Upper West and Upper East Sides. Um, the majority of the windows were replaced prior to designation. And um, in for a long period of time, the commission routinely approved a one over one configuration to achieve consistency, although with an improved profile and cut finish. And, um, and then more recently, we've been a, a little more site-specific about that, and we have been looking at the building itself, its prominence, its style, its level of decoration and ornament to determine whether one of a one would detract from the building's style. And if the building has enough of other features that reflect its style, we have found a one of a one to be appropriate. Um, I would love that the applicant presented um, a, actually a, another building in this style in this historic district that was originally constructed with one over one double windows. So, um, the idea that a one over one is, you know, could be found consistent with the style, I think, is evidenced in that building. But we do know here that the building originally had multi light steel windows. So we will have our discussion as we always do, and I suspect it will be a very mixed discussion. So, um, Commissioner Ginsburg, would you like to start this one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I think for a few reasons, as this was pointed out in the testimony, over the next 20 or 30 years, people are going to have to replace their windows. Uh, also, casement windows by the very nature of energy efficient and double -head windows. So, I would like to see the applicant go back and make a proposal to put in modern casement windows that, to some degree, match the existing windows in style, but will probably have somewhat thicker lines, et cetera, to have double, glaze, double glazing. I also understand why they weren't having moved in an apartment that had the steel basement that looked like a silver single glass there, that not only from an energy, but from a comfort perspective. But I think they should look at installing casement windows. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that, um, you know, for, for almost 100 years, 90 years, 4% uh, of these windows survived. Uh, and so I, I agree with Commissioner Ginsburg. Okay, Commissioner Lutter. Um First of all, I, I think the steel multi pane windows are beautiful. And, you know, I sort of mourn the loss of them throughout the city. Uh, I happen to think that in this particular building, um, there is a, enough ornamentation to support um, the installation of, you know, one over one uh, windows here. I do also feel very strongly, and I I know this is not within our purview that. Yeah, you know, this building you're doing is doing its shareholders, if it's a co-op, a, a disservice by not doing a master plan right now. You are going to have to comply with local law 97, and it's here. It's not, it's like next year, 2024, the whole process is starting. And 
So what I think you want, and, and by, you know, 2050, you know, the fines are going to be very severe if you don't. So what you want to do for yourselves is put together a master plan a windows that are going to comply and that make it easy for the shareholders to do what they need to do and ultimately collectively serve the entire co-op. So um, I would like that passed along to the owners. <laughs> okay, thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. It's amazing to me. Um, the energy code um, helps us restore the building to its existing condition, historic existing condition. That's wonderful. So I, five for the three generations, but 20 years, 75, but 60 years, and it would be restored. Fine with me. Okay. Commissioner Goldberg. Who just like it? <laughs> Not in the minority. The windows should be uh, restored to uh, casements with the mullions that uh, reflect the original design intent of the architect. In my view, this building is exemplary of the kind of building that would benefit from uh, the detailed windows, uh, irrespective of, of the energy performance, which of course is much better, but uh, the, from a historical uh, uh, perspective, historical preservation perspective, this building was created with a vertical design emphasis in the Art Deco period, stylish, and uh, the uh, Malian pattern was integral to that. Uh, so I think that it should be restored. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, well, I was uh, somewhat sympathetic uh, to uh, Jean's view, which is that this uh, is a fairly ornamented building. It's always a very difficult, uh, you know, I think proposition when so many windows have been replaced, but obviously it would be very attractive to have the original windows replaced. And since that seems to be the majority of the commission at this point, I will support that because I certainly can support it. Uh, so anyway, as appropriate. Thank you, Vice Chair Land. Well, bringing up the rear, as I often do on this topic, um, I, can, I don't support that position. I support Jeannie's position, which is this building. It's interesting how uh, this set of commissioners as individuals agree on so many things, uh, but I don't see that this building is is such an art deco building that it requires that um, that steel window uh, original condition which of course i accept as that was what was then uh, uh, installed but to me this building um, uh, is not such that it really requires or demands that um, that window arrangement or, or configuration so i would support what's being proposed by the owner partly um, I guess to uh, to deal with the consistency issue, which I think um, is an important preservation uh, motivation. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so uh, we don't have uh, enough groups to take an action in our way today, so we will uh, not take an action. We'll ask you to think about the comments that we've heard. Um, today, and we've heard uh, some in support, some who uh, would recommend returning the original configuration, and maybe there's some room for a, a casement operation that evokes or recalls the historic window um, without uh, necessarily replicating it. But I think that's something that you should uh, explore and think about, and we'll come, and you can come back to us when you're ready. And, Again, I would uh, strongly encourage the building to think about this as a master plan. And uh, we'll now move to the next item. Okay, we're now going to move to uh, public meeting items on the agenda. The first is public meeting item number one, LPC 23-03194. Do pause for just a second. 
Okay, let's just take a five minute break um, as we we do have um, some recusals that will affect the, our ability to act on the next couple of items. And so we're going to see if we can rearrange this. Yep. Okay. All right. We're going to just rearrange the schedule a little bit so that we can keep moving until our uh, other, until another commissioner arrives. All right. Okay, so we'll actually uh, proceed with public meeting item number two. This is LPC 22-07227, mm -hmm. an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1676, lot 61. 345 Decatur Street in the Bedford Stuyvesant Expanded Stuyvesant Heights Historic District. This is a strict Italianate style row house designed by George H. Pryor and built in 1878 with later alterations. The application is to alter the facades, construct a rooftop addition, and excavate a portion of the rear yard. This was last presented at the public hearing of April 25th, 2023, and no action was uh, taken at that time. Uh, the applicants uh, will begin with the revised presentation after we open the proceedings. Let's just take a five minute break. <laughs>
All right, uh, commissioners, thank you, uh, and thank you to the public for bearing with us as we um, work through our schedule. Today, we are now going to move to public meeting number three, and I will turn it over to Corey to read it in. All right, try this again. Public meeting item number three, LPC 23-0559. This is an application for certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, Block 1166, Lot 13, 155 Underhill Avenue, Prospect Heights Historic District. This is a Renaissance Revival, Romanesque Revival style row house designed by William H. Reynolds, built circa 1897. The application is to alter the roof facade and install a rooftop deck and mechanical equipment. This was last presented at the public hearing of June 6, 2023, and no action was taken at that time. Uh, the staff will uh, walk us through the revisions to the proposal. Uh, um, commissioners, Timothy Shaw, reservation staff. Um, um, sorry. So 155 Underhill, uh, located on Underhill, just south of Park Place in the Prospect Heights, Prospect Heights Historic District. And um, this is just a view of the Clemson block land and a view of the front facade. Um, as Noted that part of the present were two components of the proposal, a rooftop, um, rooftop deck, bulk and mechanical equipment, and uh, changes of the rear facade. So this was the uh, this is the existing section. And you can see the photos at the bottom right and top of the roof um, proposed, just to give an overview of the the um, the proposal. Uh, at the point of in June, uh, commissioners were generally supportive of the rooftop mechanical and rooftop bulkhead. There is some visibility from a distance along Park Place, but there's no visibility over the front facade from under that room, and there was visibility over the rear facade from Park Place, but it was um, generally supportive as visible mechanical and, and in keeping with other. Uh, Visible impacts and railings in the district. Um, some commissioners, uh, commissioners were concerned with the more of the bay. This is the existing elevation, so there was a historic bay that has been clad in siding, um, and um, you know at least the form is still there. There's no historic fabric remaining. Uh, the original proposal was to remove that bay and put in um, just sliding glass doors with a new deck. And remove a non historic or a, a, a very small rear addition. Um, most commissioners were uh, concerned with this proposal uh, and felt that there should be some retention or um, restoration or replication of the building. Um, and uh, most commissioners, or some commissioners, were supportive of doing a new building with a more modern interpretation. So this uh, revised proposal. Um, it is a metal with full uh, glazed openings and a, a more modern interpretation of the cornice at the top with a deck uh, as previously proposed. This is the existing and the previous proposal and the new proposal side by side for comparison. So the size is roughly uh, equivalent to what is there now. Um, and again, these are the uh, these are photos of the existing condition, uh, and just showing how there's um, it would need to be uh, renovated or rebuilt, um, and there's no historic fabric there uh, underneath. Uh, just showing it in plan. Uh, again, that uh, existing at the top, previous proposal in the middle, and the new proposal at the bottom. Um, and just some closer elevations and a, some axons. This is the previous proposal and the current proposal. And um, so a close up on that, just and a section of that bonus detail showing the sort of there's a bit of a reveal, but it's not a, you know, it's not meant to be a true restoration of that bonus detail. Um, and just, uh, we do have also the information about the roof deck, um, but I think that was generally supported. Yeah. So I don't 
if you don't if we don't need to go through it, I'll, I'll stop okay. there with the, the bay. All right. Thank you, Tim. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Um yes. I just wanted to know, because um, I can't really tell, you might have it in here and I missed it. In terms of the bay mm -hmm. window, what, what's the depth? Is it like, I, it's hard to see because we're re I'm reading it flat. There's a plan drawing maybe to, plan yeah. to that. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, here's the plan. It's It's roughly the... You can't see if the oh, oh thank right you. There. It's thank roughly you. the same as what okay. is there now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then is there just going to the plan? Oh no, I answered just to answer my other question. Okay, thank you. Good. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, not seeing any other questions, I think we'll move to our discussion. And um, as Tim described the last time we saw this, we did note that the existing bay uh, is clad in modern fabric and there wasn't any historic fabric. But we also noted that it was part of a very long row of buildings that had a continuous bay, albeit they are also altered and clad in different materials. Um, and so the commissioners present felt that it was important to retain the form of the bay, but many uh, suggested a moderate interpretation. And so the applicants are back with something that um, returns a, a bay form or maintains a bay on um, this building, but with a different articulation. Um, so we'll begin our discussion, Commissioner Jefferson. I think the last time you even suggested they could do something in glass, and modern, really modern and interpretive. So um, how are you feeling about this one? Um, this one, um, keeping the existing bay does it for me. So. Okay. And so um, altering the facade, yes, appropriate. Altering... Um, Uh, installing a roof deck and mechanical equipment, all that as well. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful application. I think it's, um, you know, these blocks are so interesting in that some of the backyards are a, a jumble, some of them are, are remarkably uniform, and that's really what gives them their character. In, um, and I think it's 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 wonderful that we're able to preserve this kind of rhythm and a texture on what is a, a relatively uniform uh, block. So I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner Ginsburg. I agree with my fellow commissioners. Approvable, appropriate. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. I think the uh, the the, um, the latest version is an improvement over the last one per the commissioner's suggestions. Okay. Commissioner Latfi. A nice job. I think it works really well. I would say just work with staff a little bit on the materiality to make sure the metal is up high quality so that it will last. And since they went to the trouble of making this uh, alterate, you know, altered design, which is wonderful. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I, I think it's very successful, and I'm pleased that they were able to incorporate the bay, which, uh, you know, is a feature of the row. It wouldn't always require such a thing, but in this case, I think it was really uh, important to the sense of the row, and they've done a very nice job. So, And the, the uh, rooftop is fine. Thank you. And Vice Chair Brand. Yeah, this is now appropriate. All right, thank you. So I think we can go ahead and make a motion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you be able to read the motion? In the matter of LPC-23-055991, Underhill Avenue, Prospect Heights Historic District, application is to alter the rear facade and install a rooftop deck and mechanical equipment. I note, Oh. Our scale material and details are among the features that contribute to this special architectural and historic character of the Prospect Heights Historic District. I recommend approval finding 
that the installation of the new deck with railing and operable sky, skylight hatch and HVAC equipment at the roof may not damage or eliminate any significant architectural feature, that the new AC unit and exhaust flues will not be visible over the front facade from the Underwood Avenue, under Hill Avenue, and will only be visible from a limited distance area to the west along Park Place. I will not overwhelm the building and the streetscape. That the deck railing will be in keeping with the simple design of railing visible over secondary facades found elsewhere within the row and historic district. That the existing bay window at the rear facade has been altered, is not visible from the public thoroughfares, and, it, and is at the end of a row. Therefore, its removal and replacement will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building. That the new bay window, when we call the form and placement of the historic bay window within the row, and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historical character of the building or the historic district. Thank you. And Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? So, uh, second, yes. <clears throat> Will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Vice Chair Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion passes. All right. So that's approved. Thank you. All right. We're going to now break for lunch and we'll come back about 12. 40 and um, we'll resume with the afternoon items and uh, it will ask all members of the public to voluntarily exit the meeting at this time so that you don't have te technical difficulties if you wish to rejoin and um, the remote commissioners you just as always need to just uh, turn your audio and, and video off thank you we'll see everybody at 12 40.